All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Scott Robinson, uh, our speaker tonight. Um, Scott is the Ordway Professor of Ecosystem Conservation at the Florida Museum of Natural History. He's also uh, affiliated with the University of Florida at, Gain at Gainesville. <laughs> Uh, I've known Scott for a long time. Scott was my major professor for my PhD work at the University of Illinois back in the late 80s, in the early 90s. Uh, I think I was Scott's second student, I believe, that uh, graduated. But anyways, Scott's career in uh, avian ecology has spanned many disciplines, including community ecology, landscape ecology, dem demography, and behavior. Uh, he started his work in the Northeast, working in the Northeast forests, the temperate forests of the Northeast. And then he came to Illinois. Uh, when he was at Illinois, he worked for the Illinois Natural History Survey and also the University of Illinois. Did a lot of forest fragmentation work in the Midwest. But his PhD work was actually in tropical rainforests in Peru. Uh, as the director of the Ordway Lab of Ecosystem Conservation, he oversees a large group of uh, graduate students that are pursuing research in tropical landscapes throughout the world. Um, Scott's a very distinguished ornithologist with a very strong uh, academic record, but he's also an avid birder. In fact, he's held the ABA uh, North American Big Year record, which he set in 1976 while he was in uh, college. And he's twice been part of teams that have set the World Big Day record. Oh, I'm trying to hold it. That way you can see it first uh, set that in 1982 and then in uh, sec again in uh, reset it again in 2018. So before I turn it over to Scott though, I'm gonna ask uh, if folks would put themselves on mute so that we don't uh, interfere with Scott while he's talking. And then uh, Scott, the floor is all yours. Okay, let's see if I can get, get the technology right. Share. Is this it? It's there. Now you just got to do the presentation mode and you'll be all set. So, so you're not seeing my, my, my the hideous pink screen then? We can see a little bit of it, but you're good. It's mostly the, the nice uh, slide. You're all set. All right, good, good. So uh, thank you very much, Jim. And I, I really appreciate the willingness of all of you to, to uh, sit through what might be a rather uh, a, 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 a talk right after a big day of bird watching. I, I would usually be sound asleep by now. And if, if any of you want to sleep through this, I won't know about it. So that, that's the best thing about having your, having your uh, microphone on mute. As Jim said, I, am a, I was a bird watcher before I was a scientist. And in fact, it was quite astounding to me that when I got to college, that I, that, that I could actually use my bird watching skills to get paid and, as a summer intern. And then that there was actually a potential career in it. I really didn't know that you could do anything other than work in uh, in a museum uh, with with bird skins which is something that of course it's I, I, i'm at a museum now but i'm very very much of a field biologist i always have been someone who likes to work out in the field and watch watching birds uh my bird watching background let's see this is an advanced yeah i i have to give you know, i i don't have very many slides of my early youth which is probably a really good thing for all of you but I have to give my father, Bill Robinson, credit for all this because uh, he, in addition to being an avid conservationist in the late 50s and 60s, when it was not yet particularly fashionable, he was also a fanatical and very good bird watcher. He was also a, a surgeon and, and many had many other interests in life, but he was a very good bird watcher. And eventually he convinced me that I, you know, that he sort of, he, he recognized that I was at least moderately interested in birds and, and he just, one day, instead of just trying to hard sell, he he uh, had to be a field guide and a pair of binoculars was pretty good and said, I think you might be interested, just try this out. We were in Florida, not too far from where I live right now. Um, and uh, the next day he took me out bird watching and for the rest of my life, I've been pretty much fanatically focused on, on birds. And in, and in fact, it's I've barely been paid to do anything but watch birds or, or study birds, except for those few times I've been a department chair, which is when I actually earned, earned my, my salary uh, fairly and squarely. But my father also was very tolerant and I felt uh, he's probably also the most competitive human being I've ever known in my life. And one of the joys of bird watching was in seeing things before he did and 
competing with him and getting bigger lists. And, and so I have a side to me that is extremely competitive as those birding records say. Um, that's not always an easy side to mix in with the, the scientific side because when you're, when you're bird, a lot of us bird listeners, not all of us, we want to get see more species than anyone else. We want to set records. We want to win whatever the competition is. And sometimes that's a that's a different mindset from the kind of objectively watching birds. And and one of the most striking things for me as a scientist or you know, and bird watcher is when you're bird watching, you're trying to find something unusual, doesn't fit the pattern, which is good for science too. But sometimes when you're doing science, you're also trying to kind of make everything familiar, put it in bins, gather data. And I, I personally, at least at my own level, I personally found that to be sometimes somewhat challenging. And that's, uh, but nevertheless, my bird watching background, I think, has given me a huge advantage in, um, in, in a lot of in my scientific career. And in fact, a lot of what I've chosen in my life has been uh, projects that benefit either from my own bird watching skill or, in my case, mostly ben benefit from the bird watching skills of others. Um, and I, you know, Jim mentioned my my various you know, the, you know, the big year record, but the uh, after I finished my PhD working in I'm sorry my undergraduate degree working in the in the White Mountains of New Hampshire that's a very low diversity area and I was I felt I was feeling kind of like you know I want to I've been on an undergraduate trip to Costa Rica and experience the tropics and I you know I, I wanted to go somewhere where there was just an awful lot of birds so we chose uh, I chose graduate school to work with John Turborg. And we went down to this little area. This is the map of the species richness of birds. The hotter the color, the more birds there are. And the hotter, you know, the, the, the richest places in the entire world are the western edge of the Amazon basin. And, and my eventual thesis advisor, John Turborg, had a field station located right here in the Manu National Park of southeastern Peru, very, very western edge of the Amazon basin there, in a place that is still almost entirely forested for thousands of, of miles, for at least. 1500, 1800 miles. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go work with, with John because I really want to try to understand how can there be this many species. This is John Turborg, uh, who is uh, easily, well, you know, they're one of the two or three greatest tropical ecologists in the world. He studies plants and primates and birds and succession and predation and mammals. There's, there's very little he hasn't studied in tropical biology. But he, like me, he was a bird watcher in his youth. He is one of the very few living people who has seen an actual Bachman's warbler. Um, and he and I, we, we were, he lives now where I am now, and we, we went bird watching yesterday, uh, just, just right around his, his house. So he's still very, very much active in all of this. And he was also probably just about the toughest human being on the planet. He, he did pioneering work in the Andes when you had to hike for two days just to get to the base camp, you know, through, you know, through, you know, poor trails and lowland uh, forests, carrying gear, then go back. They sometimes have spent two weeks just to establish enough of a base camp. So he has really been, he's done a lot of primary exploration in South America. And also I might add in New Guinea where he worked quite a bit with, with, the, the, with Jared Diamond. And this, these kinds of plates and field guides were very intriguing to me because you look at this plate, which includes a bunch of ant trikes and ant wrens and a, and a few other miscellaneous ant vireos and ant birds. You, there, there are lots of birds that look an awful lot alike down there, but that are incredibly poorly known. Probably at the time this field guide was made, probably two thirds of these, the, the nests had never been described. And we had no, we were just beginning to get a, a, a faintest glimmer of, of the, what their social organization was, what they ate, where they lived, how common they were. We knew almost nothing about them. And to me, this was irresistible because we, you know, I really wanted to learn something about these birds. That, but to get down to this part of the Amazon basin, even now it's not easy, but back in those days, there was a single road. You can barely see it here, the famous Manu Road. If you've ever had any, if we ever do ecotourism again, God knows you don't want to go to Peru right now, but if Peru ever, ever, uh, it solves its COVID problems and it's probably far worse political problems. This is about, about as good a birding as it gets. There are 1,100 species that have, that have been recorded on this road. That is the Amazon basin out there, which is also, and, but there are birds that occur in elevational bands here. And in fact, 
after I left Illinois, one of the reasons I left Illinois was because I knew I would have a chance to go back to this place. But we had, you know, we had to get, we had to go down this road to get to the Amazon basin and pass all of these ecosystems where nothing was known. These were a bunch of birds were, were the, at the time we did this, were, uh, the, you know, the knowledge is almost zero. We had to take trucks. We had to sit on the tops of trucks. It was cold and dusty in the highlands. Here's John himself. So we have several, uh, here's John sound asleep here. This is, you can tell we're on our way out here. And we would sit in these trucks for two days. And then it was a boat trip of two to two to three days, depending on the, uh, the water levels. The, the road itself was an engineering marble, but it was also a very, very narrow road. It was one way up, one way down. Uh, the, you know, the trucks would routinely get stuck along it. Uh, there were landslides and so on. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But eventually we got to this place here, which is called the Kocha Cashew Biological Station. It, 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 even to this day, it's still a very basic, primitive place. When we went there, uh, there were no, you know, there, there was no electricity, no connection with the outside world. World War III could have happened and we never would have found, we would have found out about only eventually. Like almost everywhere in the tropics, there's a dry season when it's quite lovely, when we could swim out in the lake here. And, and then there's a wet season when life is absolutely miserable. But when the water levels rise, when you're, you get foot fungus and the mosquitoes are, are very thick. So most of us, of course, go during the dry season when life is, life is perfectly grand there. Uh, the, the, again, with the, the food we ate was pretty basic, but this was, a, this was an actual exploration. Almost everyone in this picture now is a, has, has, has had a great career in ecology. Or, um, and, uh, and there were some, you know, this was the place where John Fitzpatrick of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology fame got his start. He did his PhD thesis with John Turborg as well. Here's John. This is Pat Wright, who did her PhD thesis here as well. You may have heard of her. She's the one who is probably the most prominent scientist and promoter of conservation in Madagascar right now. This, uh, this is her daughter, Amanda. And this is Robin Wright, who a few of you may know. He is a botanist with the Field Museum, a plant ecologist, and was one of the, is one of the two or three people in the world who know the most about tropical plants. He almost uniquely, there's one other person who's not uniquely, uh, Al, Al Gentry, but he was killed in a plane crash about 30 years ago. But Robin can identify essentially every tree in the tropics. And that's about five, 10 times more difficult than identifying the birds, because there are a lot more species. At the beginning of the field season, this is Charlie Munn, who was my classmate in graduate school. Um, you look, you know, you would show up looking every inch the, the, the Princetonian that he was. By the end of the field season, we all look pretty, pretty grungy as we try to get out of there during the wet season. We had many Peruvian assistants, some quite colorful, and the field station itself was surrounded by uh, native tribes that are we're just now being contacted. They, we're now coming to realize that almost the whole Amazon basin supported large civilizations that were also were all wiped out by diseases, but there are still uncontacted tribes in this area. These are three women from the Mashko Piro tribe uh, who appeared on the beaches. They're all still alive, and actually the, the mother I think died just two years ago, but they just let, you know, they, they left their tribe or were kicked out of their tribe. We're not quite sure which, and, and they've now moved, you know, but they've now assimilated into the indigenous community. The, these are the, um, uh, the, actually, this is the, the, the you know, Piro tribe, another group of it that uh, had attacked a, an oil or petroleum exploration uh, station and stolen all these various gear. So they were very friendly to us for some reason. We had this little field station where we didn't hunt or kill anything. And these, these the native tribes were somewhat puzzled by this. Uh, and the Machiganga Indians, these were all, you know, this was, a, again, this was a place where we were trying to get to pristine nature. This was, we figured our best chance and maybe the last chance we would have to understand what bird communities were like, what these species did before humans settled them. This we figured was a great chance to do it. Of course, again, this, you know, have a different idea of the shifting baseline. The humans have been here for a really long time and everything we're seeing has been strongly affected by humans. But at the time, I don't think we really appreciated that very well. Oops. Um, now I should point out just as a somewhat of an apology, I went down to, work at Kochikashu to study, uh, to you know, heroically study tropical rainforest birds. But all of the thesis topics that I proposed were, 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 were uh, uh, nixed by my committee. And they told me to study a bird called the yellow rumped cacique, which is a very beautiful, colorful, interesting tropical bird. 
But my entire thesis was spent in approximately this position. I was I, I would go out there, sit down, watch birds. I didn't have to lift my binoculars without support from my elbows. And, and occasionally I had to stand up and take birds out of mist nets. But I had the easiest thesis probably in the history of Amazonian biology. I spent about 10 or 11 hours a day in a boat. Uh, and believe me, this is called a full boat and it is comfortable. And But this bird, in addition to having very interesting social behavior, which I won't talk about too much, it also was, was a real opportunity for me to see just how important predation is. One of the conclusions that we're still struggling with, that we're trying to come to terms with, is just how much predation there is in these forests. If this forest here, this particular stretch of forest here, has more than 150 breeding species that overlap it, you know, they're just on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And this, this particular plot here, uh, you know, the, this is embedded in the Cochicachu biological area, a couple thousand acres, now has a species list approaching 600. So vastly more species than there are in Illinois, almost 10 times more breeding species, maybe five times more breeding species than you would get in, in a typical Illinois forest in here. So the diversity in this area is in fact mind bent. But every once in a while, a bird, convenient, conveniently enough for me, the yellow rump deceit, got around its predators. There was this tiny little island, a one tree island. This is an oxbow lake of the Manu River, which I'll show you a little bit later. Cochicachu Biological Station is right here. This little tree here had vast numbers of caciques on it. Another place did up here. They escaped predation. Predators left them alone. They build these pouch-like nests and colonies. They're routinely attacked by toucans but they can generally chase two cans away. If you, and when, when it, as part of, after I finished my thesis on this bird, we did a massive census of all the birds of a 250 acre, 100 hectare plot. And we found there were a couple of mysterious places where the species richness dropped from about 150 or 160 down to about 50 or 60. And every, all of these areas where the species richness was low, was a function of, was, was perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not, where they were, had these huge colonies of yellow rump caciques, which were eating virtually all of the food, fruit, nectar that everything else eats. And we, we think that this may be a case where, where you know, the, with the relaxation of predation, a few birds took over large chunks of the community, excluded many others. Whereas in these areas here that were far from the colonies, they weren't much affected. And in this, in fact, this is a tedious slide, but I mean, this is again, just a very uniform carpet of green. If you look at, if you plot the number of territories or home ranges per 100 hectares, 250 acres, about 40% about of a square mile, uh, and you rank them in order of decreasing density, the only thing to remember from this slide is that the vast majority of birds nesting in these forests occur in population densities of less than five pairs per 250 acres. So that means a typical woodlot in the Chicago area or in Lake Shelbyville in Illinois or, or the many, many of your favorite migrant traps, they, they wouldn't be big enough to have even one territory for a lot of these birds. And this rarity is one of the dominant features. These forests contain hyper diverse bird communities, but they, the bird, most of the birds are exceedingly rare and patchy. We think this is because of predation, but this is, this is not an easy thing to study. And when you look in these forests, we, you know, in, in Illinois, when I went back to Illinois, we, we studied uh, predation and parasitism, and, and we concluded that nest predation decreased diversity. That was for a different set of reasons. But when you look at these forests, you find that there are a tremendous number of nest predators. There are white-lipped peccaries that have boom and bust population cycles, but when they're common, it's perfectly normal to see two or 300 of them a day. They eat everything on the ground. There are medium-sized monkeys. We, we, you know, there's a lot of people talk about uh, top-down pre you know, predation effects and how predators rule the world because and how they benefit life by controlling meso predators, medium-sized predators, like, like we need wolves to kill uh, uh, you know, raccoons or to change patterns of herbivory. Uh, we need bob you know, So without these, but on the other hand, there are some medium-sized occasional nest predators like capuchin monkeys. That are actually pretty terrifying. Uh, you know that are that are very very good at escaping predation. These are brown capuchin monkeys. Even though this forest has harpy eagles and crested eagles too, 
to raptors that will eat them. We have no records of them ever catching one. So these monkeys are very common. They have more biomass, just as one species has more biomass than the entire bird community. So they really dominate this life. And there are snakes, which turn out to be the, by far the most important nest predators, at least in the understory. Toucans, which for all their reputation as jolly fruit eating birds, they're actually they probably spend more of their day eating, uh, eating nests, you know, attacking and searching for nests and eggs. And then the, so ground nesting birds such as pinamus really have very little chance of fledging young. You have to just keep nesting over and over again, live a long time, just keep trying. And we think this is simply because most of these birds, their populations are kept in check by these predators. Now, I should, when, when, when John Torberg and I were doing this census, or at least we were trying to get funding to do this census, we were aware that there was a class of bird watchers that was in a different league from us. We, we were good birders. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a pretty good bird, but, but I knew that there was another league of bird watching for, you know, that was above what I did. And this is Ted Parker, who was, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have, have heard of his reputation, but at the time of, before his tragic and very premature death, about to, in the same airplane crash that killed Al Gentry, Ted was pretty much universally agreed to be the world's greatest bird watcher. You have to understand that back in the 70s and early 80s, when we worked in this part of the world, there were no field guides. The, all we had was the Chalancey birds of South America, which is full of misinformation and had no, no real flights. We really didn't have any knowledge of the bird songs. And Ted went down and pioneered with carrying a hugely heavy Nagra tape recorder and a Sennheiser mic and recorded for the first time the songs of hundreds of species. He went, he did, you know, he, he participated in many LSU collecting expeditions. No matter what you, or, you know, some of you may have uh, doubts about the importance of collecting, but without these museum specimens, we really would have no idea what the biodiversity of these birds was. And Ted, Ted's specialty was bird songs, and he found, he found the songs identified for the first time hundreds of species of birds in South America, and especially in Peru. And so we invited Ted to join us in this census, which he did very happily, um, because, we, because we thought he would find a bunch of birds. And in fact, he rediscovered a bird called a rufous fronted ant thrush right in the middle of our study plot, somewhat embarrassingly, um, during the actual period when we did a census. Of, we did the first complete census ever done of a large tract of forest in the neotropics, or actually in the whole world tropics. Uh, there were some smaller scale studies done. So, but on the other hand, having Ted there as this consummate bird watcher was really, to me, presented an all, you know, we, we simply had to do a big day there. Oh, but, but um, oh, this is, by the way, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the kind of work they do in museums where you really, you, know, you go and collect birds. And one of my former students, Gustavo Londonio, just collected this new this species of anthid. It turns out this is a new species of anthid, the Pharyonis de Cali anthid that, that, they, that they've described. And this is the kind of thing that LSU has done. They have probably described 80 or 90 new species of birds, uh, all of which have a huge ecotourism industry. Now, at in the surface of it, a big day in the Amazon lowland forest is not a very promising scenario. Look at this scenario. This is unbroken forest that extends east about 1,800 miles in this direction. And it's flat, it's relatively featureless. There are some rivers which are really important. And there's the Oxbow Lakes I showed you earlier. These rivers are great for vagrants and wandering birds. And the birds that live out in this scrub along the rivers as these rivers meander back and forth across the floodplain. These aren't very diverse, but they, the species are different from the forest. So there's some birding opportunity. But when you actually look at these, these new fancy radar images of the land and you see all the different colors. Each one of these is a different color. This is the famous Manu River as it meanders through its quite large floodplain, leaving Oxfield, it's splitting off with Oxbow Lakes. This is Cochicachu. This is where our biological station is right about here. And each one of these Oxbow Lakes has phenomenal wetland birds on it. This and I did my thesis mostly just with the boat sitting right there. And But we knew that if we just wandered around in this stretch here and went, um, we didn't even cross the river. We didn't go up into this this ridge forest here is terra firma, which doesn't flood. And we spent one day wandering around on foot and by dugout canoe in this area here, going in this little area, almost exactly two, uh, actually, well, about one square mile. 
little over one square mile. And we had 331 species of bird. This is the worst slide you'll ever see, the worst data slide. It's a good thing I took this photo a long time ago because I lost the original list. But this was you know, this at the time we, that we set this record in 80 in 1982. This record stood until three or four years ago when several different teams broke it. Although the, the record on foot has not yet been broken. Well, actually, there's a one person saw more than that on foot, but uh, but I think that technically a big year has to have two people. Now, by the ABA rules, you're not allowed to, to use helicopters or airplanes. If we had had a helicopter, we probably could have broken 500 without a sweat. Um, now, when I got to graduate, when I got to graduate school, um, I was kind of embarrassed. I was a little bit ashamed of my. This is one of the reasons why I don't have any pictures of me at this stage of my life. You can see why. But the, um, the this is a this is my thesis committee, and I just defended my thesis. But when I got when I got to Princeton to go to graduate school, no one knew about any of my bird watching records. My 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 big year, at least at that point, until this man right here, Bob May. You know, who, who before he died a couple of years ago was Lord Robert May, who was probably the greatest infectious disease person of his generation. It's really too bad he died before COVID. He would have been the probably the world's principal modeler of COVID. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he was again as a theoretical ecologist, an Australian, you know, guy who just thinks in terms of models and equations. And I, I was, I thought that being a competitive bird watcher was going to hurt my reputation. This is John Turbo, by the way, Dan Rubisi, John Bond, if you know any of these people. Um, but when Bob May found out, when, when, when my record was broken by a guy named Jim Vardaman, who uh, oh got, I think, 700 species, and he, uh, he, he was written up in the Wall Street Journal, and Bob used to read the Wall Street Journal, and he thought it was hilarious that the person whose record was broken had the same name that I did. And what I, and what I told him, actually, that is me, I thought, oh my God, here it goes. Well, he was my best friend for the rest of my time in grad school. Bob was just as competitive as I was, and he really, he really enjoyed that whole thing. And in fact, he he, he was the, the 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 big day record we set too was like that. Okay, anyway, so when we got to Illinois, I you know I I sort of was thrilled to discover. I, I'm sorry, I don't have any slides of the whole state of Illinois. I, I was just going to get one, but I forgot to put one in here. But when I got to Illinois. Um, you know, we obviously the forests in Illinois are fragmented. It's a heavily used landscape and so on. But of course, uh, you all know it's an absolutely wonderful place for birds. The Shawnee National Forest, Southern Illinois, has got huge forests. The Cache River here has got rapidly improving areas. The Illinois River has all these restoration sites. I mean, the, things are things are good in Illinois now. That when I moved there, they were just starting to turn around a little bit from the days of road to road agriculture. But but you know, I was when I got to Illinois, I discovered there's this enormous group of phenomenally skilled bird watchers. Doug Robinson is is listening in on this. At least I think he was. Uh, and you know, there were people like Doug who were. I mean, Doug was in grad school at the time. So, but 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 you know, just all these great bird watchers. Steve Bailey, a lot of the undergraduates, and and I and, and you know, I decided that we really needed to start gathering real data on forest fragmentation. How in the David, thanks to David Wilco and Stan Temple and others, we knew that these little fragments were bad places to nest. Fragmentation was a bad thing. Of course, habitat loss is probably far worse, but the fragment, the fragmented forests that were left in the end of, of were still, you know, the, were not good places for the birds to nest. They're phenomenally important in migration, as you all experience today, but they were very, very um, uh, bad places to nest. But the data that existed were very, very weak. No one really had the kinds of sample sizes you would need to understand what was going on. And this is the, unfortunately, the only picture I was able to find of Steve Bailey, who is here, here he is searching for an indigo bunting nest in a rub, typical Southern Illinois uh, rubus and poison ivy patch. Steve doesn't get poison ivy, and so I don't think he's on, on board. But anyway, Steve would, you know, these, these phenomenally skilled bird watchers, some bird watchers are good at finding nests. God knows I'm not. Uh, and other, others are good at sentencing. Doug, Doug worked in some of these field crews. Uh, I bet you went out to the tropics and has, has, has forged his own career, quite, quite similar to mine in a lot of ways. We found nests, we monitored them, we measured their fates. Uh, you know, again, using these people, you know, Steve Bailey could find 10 nests a day. Uh, and one of the first things we found, of course, is that a lot of the Illinois nests look like this. This is a wood thrush nest five wood thrush eggs, which is a little unusually large, and six cowbird eggs. And there were 
the average typical Illinois woodlot or wood thrush nest has about anywhere from two to four caliber eggs, depending on where you are. Uh, 90, generally around 90% of them are parasitized. We had nobody ever had an inkling that this parasitism was this big a problem. There were local places where it was known to be a little bit like this, but to, to have almost every bird that accepted cowbird eggs is a problem. This was what we did. You know, this this was the, a very big problem. Um, and we did you know, we did a lot of detailed studies, including of the Kentucky warbler in these landscapes, found strong edge effects. The closer you were to a pig feedlot, the more likely you were to be parasitized. The younger the forest was, the more likely you were to be predated. But we during, during the years that we did these studies, we found probably more than 20,000 nests, sent, you know, census more than a thousand points. Um, we, we did highly detailed studies of birds such as the worm-eating warbler, which had been very poorly known before, before we got there, Kentucky warbler as well. Indigo buntings, really common birds like this we used. Uh, and we gathered these enormous data sets, um, and in, including in many sites that have been restored extensively, such as the Cache River Basin in Southern Illinois. We did a lot of the pre-restoration sites. Jeff Hoover is now repeating a lot, of, has been repeating a lot of these measurements to see if the restoration has improved nesting success. And eventually we put this together with people from multiple universities throughout the entire Midwest. We have people from Indiana University, University of Missouri, um, and uh, uh, University of Illinois, and I'm forgetting one of the universities. Uh, uh, well, but anyway, there, this is a very distinguished group. Many, many famous scientists. John Faubourg is back there. Doug, you're in here somewhere. Where's Doug? Where's Doug? Where's Doug? Yeah, there, there's Doug up there. Uh, Tara is his wife. Uh, Sheila, here's Jeff Hoover. Some of you may know him. Uh, Don Whitehead from Indiana University was one of the co authors. Uh, Dirk Burhans. This is really you know, Miguel Martini, who's a professor in Brazil. You know, this is a very distinguished group. We had Frank Thompson way in the back there. Who's, who was the genius behind a lot of the analysis. And what we did was we put together all of our data from the Midwest, thousands of nests. And th this graph here, which is still, I think, being uh, mentioned as one of the, the best examples of just how difficult it is to nest in these little woodlots. Here we are in Illinois, almost all of these little green dots are little forest fragments. And the, the green areas are more or less continuous forest all, in the, all around, Huge national forests like the Hoosier and the, uh, you know, the, 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 I forget what the northern Illinois ones are, and the, the, uh, some northern Wisconsin ones and northern Michigan ones are. But they, what we, what we found is basically if you nest in these very large tracts, you have low predation, the landscape is mostly forested, daily nest predation rates are low, parasitism drops out because there's no cowbird feeding habitat. And these areas we hypothesize are sources that are propping up. With you know, sending out dispersions that are propping up the these black hole population sinks where the birds are not producing nearly enough young. Now, testing this hypothesis has been somewhat elusive. We, we think now that there may be enough that the technology now we might be able to show that these dynamics are occurring. Because one of the mysteries about it is we don't really know how long our birds live. Um, but nevertheless, these kinds of these huge teams here have, have established this at least as a, as a viable model. For hypothesizing that we need very large forest tracts. And for as, as I tell my students every year that, that I've been teaching this conservation courses of birds, the great battles of our lifetime and our children's lifetime and grandchildren's lifetime are going to be retaining these lands in public ownership because the this land is becoming priceless. And we've and you know, the, a, a lot of there's a lot of work to try to unfragment the forest, to try to reforest these long, narrow usually marginal farmlands, these floodplain areas that where again the economics of farming are pretty pretty marginal. Um, but I don't know if this is going to work. The animation is probably not going to work on this. Uh, we've, we've done some of Jeff Hoover's work repeating some of our Cache River data has shown that these parasitism rates are much lower now. This has been reforested. Uh, here, yeah, this is animated. And, the, and then the track that's in the center now, the Acadian flycatcher parasitism levels are much lower than they used to be, but the edge ones are just as high as ever. Jeff Hoover, we've also a lot of, done a lot of work on the planetary warblers down there. I should also point out that bird watching is how, is how I met my, 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 my wife, Glendy Vandera, who is uh, doing her master's thesis here on cerulean warblers and cave in Cedar Creek. Um, we had several children. And during that time, I actually 
pretty much stopped bird listing. Uh, I didn't even adopt eBird until fairly recently because I knew that for someone like me, eBird would be a fatal trap because I simply, you know, I, 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 you know, I love listing and eBirding just, just, just makes listings even more rewarding. This is our, our, our daughter, Kaylee. Uh, ha having kids was very time consuming, but I have to admit the, the, the favorite birding trips I ever took in my life were the ones I took with my kids. This is my son, Will. Uh, during when I took this slide, I didn't know it, but there were hundreds of mosquitoes biting him through his shirt. So, so, so brilliant parenting 101. He had 300 mosquito bites on the back, uh, on his back, um, which is not a good thing to get in the Amazonian Peru where there are actual diseases. Um, now, when I left the University of Illinois, one of the reasons I wanted to, I, I was so interested in switching to Florida was because I had a chance uh, to return to my roots. And remember, I told you that the Cocha Cashew Biological Station is located right about here. Um, and this is Cusco, where we, where we staged our expedition. But there's this very long stretch of the Manu Road that we used to drive through in misery on the backs of trucks. But this is also, this is the, you know, this is now, of course, the, the world's greatest bird watching road. And it goes all the way up to 3,600 meters, which is about a little under 11,000 feet. Or maybe it's more than that. Um, and it goes up from the lowlands of the, in the Amazon all the way up to this elfin forest and even what they call the Puna Grassa. This is the greatest bird watching there is. Um, again, here's just another view of that road. And this is one of the reasons this is such a great bird watching place. Is there are lots of birds that are restricted to have long, narrow, spaghetti like distributions in different genera that are very restricted to maybe just seven or 800 meters of elevation, maybe 2,000 to 3,000 feet of elevation. And these birds are all very, again, very poorly known. Um, and this is also an area that's extremely dynamic. Here's that Manu Road. Oops, I guess uh, I, I hmm, okay. Uh, there are lots of landslides along here that will wash the road out. But these, the bird communities on this, again, are wonderfully you know, beautiful, varied birds, very poorly known hummingbirds, the booted bracket tail, the long tailed silk, the famous Andean cock there on the other way. This slide came out so, so butchered. But the, you know, we're, the, again, this is a, a extremely large katinga. It's actually predatory, they actually are nest predators. They have large, you notice he has to hold it with a, with a bag because the, the, the claws can actually do, do damage. They have a lek breeding system. There's the famous cochlear rock lock ledge. There are many, many different tanagers, uh, incredible diversity of, of, of true tanagers that are unrelated to the um, scarlet summer tanager up here, which as you, as you all know, I'm sure turn to be cardinals. This is that same view of some of the landslides that occur during particularly rainy periods during El Nino years. Um, and again, this is just a place where once again, you, have, you, know, you still have to go on trucks. It's still, it's pretty rough. We still have to rebuild the road periodically when it, when it sweeps away. But here's where I took the, the model that we developed in Illinois and we started applying it to studying birds in the Amazon and along the Manu Road. This is Gustavo Londoño, a Colombian student who's a professor now in Colombia, who is, I've known many great nest searches in the world, but I think he may be the greatest. He has. He has, to my knowledge, he has at least the first descriptions of the nests of more than 70 species that he's published. So these, again, these are birds that we didn't have nests. Now, of course, there are more than 300 species in China whose nests have never been described either scientifically. But so this isn't necessarily that unusual. But Gustavo has spent a big part of his career finding the, the nests of these species and documenting them. We spent a lot of time exploration. I said, we, the royal we. These are my students working very hard. This is Jill Jankowski here. Uh, to, who did very extensive censuses in some of the really remotest parts of the Andes. These places are still brutal to get around in. They set up field camps off in the, in the brush of these areas where it rains almost constantly, do intensive mist netting of birds. Um, again, uh, this is Gustavo, again, here's Jill. A very large number of Peruvian uh, assistants, graduate students uh, who we worked with in these areas. Uh, again, these are just, uh, you know, they, this has been the most amazing opportunity because the People from Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, a lot of these countries, they are intensely proud of the biodiversity. Peru and Colombia are the number one and two countries in the world for the species lists, and they are they, they have a tremendous amount of national pride. Conservation in South America is in such great shape now compared with the rest of the world. There are huge national parks. 44% of the Amazon basin is protected now. There are really remarkable things that are being done, almost entirely being generated by, by these 
Peruvians, Colombians, Ecuadorians themselves. So this has been a, a, you know, an excellent thing. We were there in the early days. We helped uh, continue this going on. But I really think conservation in South America now is going to be pretty much exclusive, exclusively the work of, of students who are from South America. More of these huge field crews, very much in the style of what we did in, in Southern Illinois and the Midwest, incredibly skilled, dedicated bird watchers, often volunteering. And here's Jill and Gustavo again. Uh, once again, huge field crews. Like that. And along the way, we have just learned some amazing things about these birds. The, when you get up to the extremely high elevations in, the, in these Andes, these really harsh, cold, miserable environments, when it's sunny, the temperature range varies from hot to incredibly cold at night. When it's cloudy, it's bitterly cold, wet, windy. You can't see, the birds can hardly see 10 feet or even three or four feet. These birds are in very high elevations. Gustavo discovered they have one egg clutches. These are the only songbirds in the world that can sit with these birds at very high elevations in the tropics that have one egg clutches. You know, the, these, you know, we think of temperate birds having it hard, and they do in the winter, but during the breeding season, not so much. Uh, you know, they're, they're, life is good. Um, we do lots of detailed uh, studies of the birds, weighing them, doing nesting, doing a lot of physiology. We have lots of, you know, all my students are heavy, heavy into high tech. They do intensive field work. And the basic idea, again, these are the various sites. We have cloud forest, lowland, foothill forest, elfin forest. Nest predation dominates in the lowlands. We think physiological things dominate in the highlands. In these nest, all these nest finding studies we found, we have found some really amazing things. The, the nestlings of a bird called a grayish mourner, a katinga, a rather undistinguished looking katinga, their nestlings, in these simple little nests have this remarkably bright pattern. And they appear to mimic a caterpillar that is highly toxic. And when you look at the, when you look at the, the nest and you, this, this is the grayish mourner. When a predator, when you approach these, the nestlings move around exactly as a caterpillar would move around. So this very much appears to be bait and mimicry. This is a species whose this was entirely unknown 10 years ago. This, this species, the nest had never even been described. So there are all these wonderful natural history tidbits just waiting to be discovered. Now, since then, what I, I should also mention that my wife, Glendy Vandera, has become a, a successful novelist. This particular novel is a, a, Where the Forest Meets the Stars came out a few years ago. It's still selling pretty well. It's, I think it's it sold almost a half a million shares now, and she's now it has another book coming out, another one in the works. And this is a book about being a graduate student in the Shawnee National Forest studying birds. All, so it is, it's, it's a novel. So it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mass market novel. So it, it, it has some, uh, some elements to it that are, um, you know, they're, that are not necessarily for scientific eyes, but, but I think they're wonderful. Um, and they are, uh, again, this is the first novel, I think that has a bird biology graduate student as the heroine. Um, I should also point out that, that several of us recently went back to Cochicasha to repeat the census. Some of you may know that there's been a lot of talk about bird populations crashing in the Amazon basin and in the Central America. And Doug Robinson now is redoing the census in Panama as well. We redid our, the, the big census we did back in 1982, which was the first one that was done in this large plot. And this included John Fitzpatrick here, who just retired from the Cornell lab and John Turbord, uh, this is Rosa Alba here, who in fact uh, runs the Kochi Kashu Biological Station now. We went back with a lot of the same people, redid the census, and found that things are pretty, pretty much the same. I mean, things have changed a little bit, but there hasn't, fortunately for us, there haven't been any major declines of birds in this Kochi Kashu Biological Station. Uh, now, but I, I should also point out that we're also very interested in urbanization in Florida. In Florida, at least, urban areas have quite a large number of birds. I don't know. To what extent that's true in Illinois? When I lived in Illinois, urban areas didn't seem to have all that much. Cooper's hawks and red shoulder hawks are starting to invade. But in Florida, these, these areas and these urban gradients are, are uh, sometimes quite surprisingly rich in birds. This is a sandhill crane that nested in a parking lot next to a, bur in a Burger King drive through. Uh, they you know the sandhill cranes. I don't know, again, I don't know, this may be true in Illinois too. They are incredibly tolerant of humans. Uh, they will come to your bird feeder. Uh -huh. And what we found is that unlike the Midwest, where we think that the predation rates are a problem for birds, 
the most of the birds that actually nest commonly in urban areas, the house finch, the Eurasian collar dove, the morning dove, the uh, northern mockingbird, the brown thrasher, northern cardinal loggerhead shrike, their daily survival rates are much, much higher than they are in the surrounding landscape. The, the predation rates of birds in the non-urban, semi-natural settings in Florida are phenomenally high. Florida is a very, very hard place to nest unless you're in a city. Now I should point out that these are all pretty big, tough birds, but even they do much worse. So the, again, all these birds along here, this is again one of these situations where a lot of birds may be moving into urban areas because they provide a refuge from predation. The predators who live in these cities are satiated with French fries and, or eating the adult collar doves. And so they're not very major predators. Now that said, a lot of nest predators like swallowtail kites, for example, in Florida are becoming increasingly urban and they are also veteran, you know, tireless nest predators. So this is again, one of these interesting situations where we're adopting that same approach that we did in the, in the Shawnee and in the Manu Road, doing this nest predation studies. And again, I should point out that I probably have found at most a 10th of 1% of the nests that have been discovered by these field crews. Um, I'm also very interested now in working you know, to try to try, try to help the young generation of Chinese scientists and conservationists promote conservation in their country. China is, of course, doesn't necessarily have the best reputation for environmental issues in the world, but I promise you there is a young generation of Chinese uh, ecologists, academics, bird watchers, photographers who are intensely interested in doing ecological research and promoting conservation from within their own country. So there is an opportunity in China now where there really are a lot of endangered birds and the, where the bird communities are oddly enough less well known than they are in, in the Amazon and the Andes. And this is, this is one of the things I'm trying to do now, working with people like Yang, Lang, Yang Liu here, um, who is a professor at Sun Yat-sen University, and Dan Liang and uh, Xin Yuan Yunan who, here, who is, uh, I said that wrong, well, uh, Shannon Shi, sorry, um, who are again, all studying birds, doing the same kind of work that we do. Yang is one of the best bird watchers. He's doing a postdoc with David Wilkov now, and papers about to come out that explores the, you know, the wildlife trade in China and uh, the implications of that. And I, I believe, I actually do believe that China is going through the same kind of uh, awakening of environmental consciousness that we did in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and is continuing uh, very strongly today. And so I think this is a very encouraging trend because clearly uh, if China can come around, it will, this, this will have a very far reaching effect on the world. And also they've got great birds, poorly known, the fire throat, the, Himalayan Kudia here, and many of these birds, unknown nests. Uh, they're just now starting to get data on. We also do a lot of work in, in, in Africa. Uh, uh, in fact, our students work all of the tropics, as Jim said. And as I, as I think I mentioned, the emphasis here is on graduate students. I really hardly do any field work at all myself anymore. It's kind of ironic. I spent all those years becoming uh, this you know, a, a fanatical bird watching field biologists. And basically what I do now is sit at my desk and write proposals and read theses. And, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I now go bird watching again. Many of you know Jeff Braun, George Anger, Doug Levy, Craig Bankman. Uh, this is, here we are birding in, the, in uh, Peru on a bird watching trip. We, we often, a bunch of my friends and my cohort often get together and, and uh, just try to just pick some exotic place and go actual bird watching, pretty much bird listing. Um, and, and, and in fact, this particular phase of my life is really becoming quite fanatical. Here's Mike Ward, for those of you who know Mike and Jeff Braun, uh, TJ Benson, and, uh, so, and Doug Levy, Craig Bank. This is, this, is, this is the only selfie I have ever taken. And it was when I got my 7,000th lifer, you know, which is the bristle thigh curlew at a, at a meeting in Alaska. So I don't know if I'll get too many more, especially if COVID continues to run wild. But, uh, and, and, and then the ultimate change for me is I've now become a fanatical yard listener. COVID has, I've, I've always been, I've always liked local listing, but, but COVID has forced me to stay home now more and more. And I'm in Florida and Florida is pretty good. You, your yard list now in, in, uh, in Illinois and May will be far greater than mine. But in winter, at least, I, I've, you know, we, we get some really cool birds in our yard. And that's kind of what I'm doing now. I've sort of come complete full circle now, coming back to, to the days now where we're, I don't get to field, do 
gather day the field anymore whether I'm at least I'm going to I'm going to do some bird watching. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Scott, uh, for a great talk. And if folks have questions, I think maybe it might be best if they put it in the chat and then we'll pass it along that way. Um, so Scott, you've birded in all over the world. Do you have a favorite spot to go birding or? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> right now it's my yard, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the Cochicachu Biological Station, the Amazonian Peru, it's kind of weird because the Amazonian Peru is, you get you have the images to be hot and muggy all the time, but the southern part of the Amazon basin actually gets cold fronts routinely. And when the weather, when it actually cools off into a nice New England September kind of weather pattern or, or uh, October in Illinois. And uh, it's just about the nicest place I've ever been. You can walk, it's flat, it's, uh, it's really, really great. But um, so yeah, I'd have to say, it was good old Coach Akashi. And the Manu Road is just, you really have to go. You can walk up and down along this road and stay in tourist lodges that range from luxurious to basic and, and just 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 bird watch endlessly. Although it's hard bird watching because the, you know, the birds have low population densities. But, uh, so I, in North America, my favorite birding area. So here's from Doug. Uh, you know, where's the top of your list to go to start chasing towards 8,000? <laughs> uh, for me, well, believe it or not, I've never been to Patagonia, and I've never been to the Philippines and the uh, Guiana area in Africa. I've never been to, and uh, you know, so the sort of Sahelian region I've never been to, and Sri Lanka, and um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, I wanted to get my life goal was to get seventy-five percent of the world's birds, but that's a shifting target, as we all know. Um, I think and now that the Rufus ant pit in the Andes is is now on its way to being split into 28 species or something, that, that number gets bigger and bigger. I get yeah, 8,000 is a good, you're right, Doug, 8,000. Yes, I, I, I would tell you I haven't, I do have it all mapped out, but I, <laughs> but I have to pretend I don't. Yeah, yes, yes. so uh, the Philippines, there's only a few easy, easy scores at this point. Um, and uh, that's, so I, I have to admit it's the, the, the next thousand is gonna be incredibly difficult. So. Yeah. So you, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but you mentioned you know you did the big, the big day uh, at Manu, you know in '82 and 2018, I think it was, and you said species, sort of total species were sort of similar, but were are there compositional changes happening in there that you guys are seeing? Yeah, there there are some compositional changes. We the the canopy flocks. These, one of the things that we've discovered with these color banded bird studies we do is that about 25, 30% of the birds of the Amazon basin live in permanent multi-species flocks, at least the you know, non. And these, these canopy flocks have taken a bit of a beating in the last, at some point during the last 40 years. <laughs> so you have to just say there's a pretty big gap between the census points. So this isn't a continuous data set. Uh, so there have been some changes, but no, it's pretty, you know, outside of that, they have the bamboo, there was a huge bamboo die off every 45 years, all the bamboo dies and all the bamboo birds disappear and have to scrape by waiting for the bamboo to recover. So there have been some changes like that, but the actual qualitatively, when you walk around there now, it's, it's very similar to the way it used to be, uh, it's act, which is pretty good to know because we are a very, very long way from any, any uh, human influence outside of the, the native tribes there that have been there forever and so it's um so it's actually that's a little bit of good news betty loisel who's a and john blake who are professors here at the university of florida they have much worse news from ecuador now what's yours have you been back to uh to the pipeline road yet to start resensing there uh covid killed it and so yeah, that's what i was afraid of that yeah. yeah and henry is doing it right now and he'll hopefully get one round and then next year maybe i get to help to finish it off. Yeah, I, I have no, yeah, I, I really don't know. But there are several really, you know, there, there's a Brazil study that's quite alarming as well. These are misnet studies. And so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a subset of the community. But what Doug is talking about is resentencing another 100 hectare plot that was done far better using far more modern methods than you know, that we had. We, <laughs> we, were, we were kind of developing our own methods as it, as it turns out. But, um, we don't really think that there, there has been any wholesale decline of these birds, which would you pretty much have to attribute to climate change. Um, 
there might be a little bit of a signature of a more violent storms and slightly worse El Nino wet seasons, but it's not, uh, it's not anything really dramatic. When I went back there and did census, it felt just like, just like the old days. I mean, it really was uncanny. Here, here's a good one. It says, if you were to redo your study in Southern Illinois from your earlier years, are there things you would have done differently? Um, let's see. The, uh, yeah, probably would have done more plot-based or, or demographic studies. The terrain of Southern Illinois is, is a uniquely difficult for traditional plots because it's all narrow ravines and narrow ridges. Narrow, and it's, the bird communities are pretty different in the ravines. I think we probably did it, did it about the right way. We, we probably worked on too many sites and, and didn't have enough uh, detailed demographic data. But, um, but I, I think we did, a, you know, the, the, what we need to do now is redo all that. You know, we, we need to, I know, I think Doug, you've redone some of the censuses and Trail of Tears, but I think it's, we did all that work in the 80s and 90s and uh, a little bit into the 2000s, but some of those census routes now, you know, it's been 30 years since they've been censused and it would be extremely interesting to go back there. In fact, pre-COVID, I was on my way north to, uh, to just to just kind of take a look and to see if things had in, in any way obviously changed. Someone has, some, someone told me that the yellow-billed cuckoo has declined radically and that there were fewer whippoorwills. But then, but then Mike Ward said, nah, there's still plenty of cuckoos and whippoorwills. What, what do you guys think? You, uh, you're all Illinois birders. You, do you feel that there anything that has declined or really radical changes in the last 20, 30 years? I've been in Florida for almost 20 years, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, I think the whippoorwills have most definitely declined in my area. I'm in central Illinois and there it was, I grew up with them, uh, had them on my land, but less and less and less until now I don't hear them at all. Now I do do a night jar survey once a year. Okay. Uh, the moon project for the University of Illinois. Uh, but, and there are, I do find some on that study, but nothing, nothing like there were before. They're definitely in this part of the state are uh, significantly less. They're not the only ones I've seen go down, but definitely significantly less. Okay. Anyone else want to volunteer? Well, you know, I think Mike's comment, you know, they, they have declined, I think, in the landscape. But if you get into like Mason, you get into Sand Ridge State Forest or a couple areas, they whips can still be pretty common. But they're, mm -hmm. it's just a few spots where that's true anymore. They were phenomenally abundant in the Shawnee. I mean, it was hard to sleep at night sometimes. You know, that well, the pardon me, folks. Uh, this may seem weird given that I'm not a particular, I'm only in my, uh, 29th year so and I've just lived in Illinois last year but uh Daniel Goldberg here I'm a PhD student of Angelo Caparellas oh, at oh. State University yeah, in the JWP uh auto uh, JW uh sorry yeah John Wesley Powell Audubon group and actually well first of all Dr. Robinson thank you for the wonderful talk but your image of the source and sinks of the Midwestern states regarding brown-headed cowbird nest parasitism is an image that Dr. Caparella, my advisor, always uses in his avian biology course. And he talks about how there have been declines and he's seen them through the moon counts, which he leads of Eastern whippoorwills, loggerhead shrikes, uh, red-headed woodpeckers. So birds in some of the oak savannas have declined, uh, even as forest birds are doing well and wetland birds have also declined, but especially the prairie birds too. I mean, he's talked yeah. about the studies that were done. Uh, Jeff Walk looking at a hundred years of bird surveys in Illinois, following up on the Graeber studies of the fifties. So things that Mike Ward, who's on my PhD committee actually has published in recent years. So regrettably, I've not been lived long enough in Illinois to see these changes, but I've definitely heard about them. Well, as I say, I'm really looking forward to going back and eventually redoing a lot of those old roots and just seeing, you know, it's hard to believe things wouldn't have changed at least a little bit. I mean, there's, there's got to be more. Uh, Jim Herkert. Um, 
I have a question about, you know, you were talking about prairie. I think that, uh, this is Ann Haverstock. I think that grasshopper sparrows seem to have, you know, they were the most common grassland species back in the early 90s uh, out at Nechusa. And by the time I finished 18, 20 years later, they were, their numbers were dwindling. And I was wondering if Jim, I know Jim has done a lot of prairie research and wondered if he felt that the grasshopper sparrows were in trouble. I do. Well, I, they've declined a huge amount, those in bobolink spot, in terms of a landscape bird. In fact, uh, grasshopper sparrow, I think right now is like the third fastest declining bird in the state. Okay. Uh, based on breeding bird survey data, it's, it's, re, it's got like a 7% per year decline, which is just crazy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they've been sort of flushed out of the landscape, you know, a, a compounding issue, and I think is that, especially in places like Nechusa and, you know, grasshoppers like those early restorations, they can be pretty thick. And then they, when they mature, they tend to fall out. Um, but certainly the BBS would show they're dropping just about everywhere. And same for bobolinks, they're so common in like Medewin or a few of the, you know, a lot of actually the sort of the forest preserves in the northeastern part of the state, but as a landscape bird, uh, that's getting darn rare as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but interestingly, you know, uh, and meadowlarks another one that is still common in the state, but is dropping really quickly. So, 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 but so ironically, uh, Dixon, which is in, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, so they're, they're, they're still declining even since I left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the metal arcs are dropping just about everywhere. In fact, that's that's one of the few birds that I look at that is dropping even in big grasslands. So like metal arcs are dropping at Medewin, they're mm -hmm. dropping at Goose Lake, they're dropping in the conservation areas and the landscape. Oh my God, Things I didn't know that. Uh, grasshopper yeah. sparrows and bobolinks are like holding at places like Medewin, but dropping in the landscape. So, so, and ironically, so Sicil is going up statewide. Hey, you know, Weren't the grasshopper sparrows supposed to be adapting to the no-till crop they field? Started, they moved in and they're in there, but I, I, it's not clear to me how successful they might be. Yeah. A lot of chemical use and disturbance to make that happen. But like I said, the for the BBS, I think I think they're the third worst in the state. It's just crazy. I mean, they're just like on spring bird count in Menard. They're it's hard to find right now. Good God, ten years ago, I used to get you know that you could find them numerous places. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, so uh, Dr. Robinson, if there were no other questions pending, I had one for you, if possible, please. Sure. Well, first. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as someone who's wrapping up his PhD with Angelo Caparella this year, I hope to finish by the end of December and graduate and wear some of that wonderful uh, regalia like you showed in one of your <laughs> last slides. Uh, do you have any advice in terms of searching for postdoctoral positions in conservation biology of birds or as positions related to, uh, for example, I know the IDNR or INPC have, you know, areas where you can work with bird conservation biology, but just recommendations in terms of job searches. Hopefully that'll be a little easier as the economy opens up and we get out of this pandemic within the next year. Yeah, I have three PhDs who just finished up who are unemployed right now, um, which is horrifying. You know, they're, they're, so yes, I have, you know, they're, they've all published lots of papers. So right now, you know, the COVID has destroyed the academic job market. I mean, the colleges aren't, Small colleges, which used to be a, a good backup job market, they're they're barely surviving right now. They're laying off faculty or they're furloughing faculty. They are. It's just a brutal time. I mean, I think you know. I really hate to say it, but if I were you, I would I would uh, I would stay in school another year, you know, and, and uh, try to publish as many papers as you can because things will get better. I mean, there, when I, when I was first got into the job market, there were I think there were an average of three. 300 to 800 applicants per position. The same thing is happening now. There were there were three postdocs that advertised last year that all had more than 200 applicants. Um, and uh, it's a very bad time right now. 
but then two years later, when I applied for jobs, there were lots of jobs, and I got one. Um, you know, I was, you know, they were still competitive, don't get me wrong. I mean, but you know, it was, so I think, I think patience is your, uh, I think you're gonna have to be a little bit patient. And uh, you know, if you are, if you're, if you're gonna finish really soon, well then that's fine, but it's, I, I hate to be, uh, uh, you know, you, I, you will get one, but it's the next, you know, this next year or two, probably not gonna be very good. Uh, colleges, these especially small colleges, but while well, postdocs, you know, again, um, you just have to just apply to every single one that comes up, and then just hope that hope you get you get if you know, the right one falls falls your way. There are positions out there, though. I mean, there are. Uh, one of my students that was offered a position recently that was not a bad position. I mean, he did take the job, which he probably should have, but. Uh, but there are things like that that, uh, I mean, you can drop me a line sometime and we can talk a little more if you want. Well, thank you. I was just uh, going about, I actually tried to get a copy through ISU's Milner Library of your recent paper on uh, referential alarm calls in Northern Mockingbirds that I'm quite right. excited to read. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to try to schedule a phone up interview with Brad Semmel at the IDNR next week. So that'd be great. He, be a great job. Yeah. That's something I'm considering in addition to postdoc opportunities. I mean, I've reached out to Janelle Sperry at UIUC, uh, mm -hmm. TJ Benson. So I'm still looking, but thank you for your, your advice. Yeah, yeah, if you want to stay in Illinois, they're great. I mean, University of Illinois has got some, some great people. Uh, I, I, I left the University of Illinois somewhat reluctantly because there were all these bird people. But, but uh, on the other hand, I was I was falling down the administrative vortex. I would have, I would have been some sort of chair or dean or dean lit or whatever. You know, I, I just, I, that was just a fate worse than the scientific death from my point of view. So, so I, uh, when the Florida job opened up, I had to leave. But I love, God, I love my years in Illinois. I really did. I love that landscape. I, I like openness. I don't mind. I didn't mind the cornfields. I, 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 I could have lived in Illinois the rest of my life. So. Uh, the, the winters were a little brutal, though. I have to admit. <laughs> driving an I I seventy two and you know with a quarter inch of snow that shuts down the highway because of the drifting. I had a I, I had some bad memories from from uh, trying to drive in winter in Illinois with these pitiful little snows that would drift and shut everything down. You all know this really well, but uh, I, I uh, had some near near death experiences on the highway during those things. So I think they're, uh, they're and besides, you know, Florida it's warm. It's hey, hey Jim. Yep. Can I, this is Jack. Can I ask one question? Certainly. Yeah. So my experience with U of I, and I have very a very um, insensitive nose, was that the smell of horse shit was much more disturbing than the snow. But, but I would love to know because you mentioned you mentioned in your in your talk that South America and certain countries are doing extremely well um, in 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 terms of their conservation efforts. Can you explain why they're doing so well? And as a colonial kind of empire, we, we, we you know we think we always have to help everybody. Why is South America doing so well in in terms of their conservation efforts? Well, for, well, there, there is a tremendous amount of national pride because they're, those countries are so insanely diverse. Colombia is going to have two thousand species within a few years, probably. Peru is well over, I think it's over one thousand nine hundred now, and I, I'm projecting a little bit, but these these are. And there's a lot of national pride about that. There are, uh, Columbia has more great young ornithologists, avian ecologists, evolutionary biologists than just about any country I know of outside of the, the huge countries. And they're really good and they have the year of government, uh, the, the ranchers, the coffee farmers, everyone down there is proud of their birds. And they set up these gigantic national parks in areas that are not very heavily settled. So they're easy to set them up. Because there's, you know, the, they just leave the indigenous tribes alone, let them continue to do what they what they want to do. You set up a park, and protect it from overt resource exploitation. So, um, and uh, you know, the the I, I train. You know, I have a lot of Latin American students, and they are uniformly brilliant. And uh, uh, you know, the only sad thing is that their universities in most of the universities they go to have too much teaching and not enough resources to do research. Um, and that's the only, the, probably the only real help they need from, from outside their country now is this funding. And, 
and that's changing now. Up, up until the current government in Brazil uh, was funding more research than most other countries. Uh, and obviously not under Bolsonaro, but before him, they were doing uh, funding huge projects. And Sao Paulo is one of the, has one of the largest ecological conservation funding organizations in the world. And so there's so there, there's just a, I think there's a cultural connection that is much broader and deeper. I mean, we have obviously a strong cultural connection, but I don't, I'm not sure it's quite as broad and deep. And in China, it's not a very large group of people, but it's a very rapidly growing number of people. And I really do think you know, it's a race against time to, to, you know, to, as those people get more and more power. But for now, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I, I think there's, you know, it's a young generation of people who are deeply committed. And, uh, and those countries also have the advantage of all the people live in a few cities. And so there are huge chunks of the landscape that are almost it, it, would, it would be It would be interesting to have you have a conversation uh, with us at Audubon about how we could have pointed um, uh, discussions or uh, opportunities to invest in uh, uh, China's very complicated, in my opinion, but but certainly in, in South America where there's pride and there's momentum where uh, um, monies or, or efforts could could really push things forward. It would, it would be interesting to hear more about that from you. In, in the future, from for our no, yeah, I, that, no, that that would be that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a uh, South again. I'm not saying South America doesn't need help, and, and you know, the, all the South American scientists I know love to collaborate with foreigners. But then again, you know, we all love to. But I mean, it's just you know, the academia is a very global campus. Now. That's kind of a cliche, but it's certainly applicable. And uh, but yeah, there there are but there are still countries in South America that are a lot more in need of this kind of input than others. Unfortunately, Venezuela is pretty much off limits now, um, which is really sad. Actually, there's a whole bunch of chat, aren't there? It was a great, it was a great talk. And uh, who, who, I'm sorry, who, who, who is this talking now? I, I don't want to reveal my name. <laughs> oh, okay. It's Jack Conley. It's Jack Conley. I'm I'm on the board, and and I and I think uh, I think Illinois Audubon. We we would love to have touchstones where it matters, you know. We and you and you brought up a bunch of those in your conversation where it's 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 there. There's efforts going on and it's having an impact, and uh, it's 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 really been a great discussion. I appreciate your input. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. I was thinking the same thing, so I would love to maybe I'll connect with Scott and we can talk about that a little bit more. Explore. Sure potential is there. Okay, here's a comment. Snake predation by tree climbing snakes has to be very different in northern versus southern Illinois. North of I-80, we really do not see snakes climbing. So there are no rat snakes up there? Huh. Have you noticed any difference in predation levels of birds in north or? Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. It does, I mean, that, that's a good question. I mean, we, we, most of our camera traps on nests were in southern Illinois, and God knows the rat snake was a. Although the rat snake's very hard to get in the camera trap because they don't move very fast. So yeah, we don't get, get rat snakes in the north. Seems no, about I eighty, they, they seem to stop. But 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 but, the, but they're replaced by fox snakes, aren't they? Yeah, we don't see fox snakes in trees, though. Oh, you don't. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, we don't like yeah, That's actually that's a really interesting question. I don't. That would that actually is the kind of thing that I would love to study. A little green snake is usually seen in trees. I mean, I've seen it in trees. But there, there does seem to be a, a gradient where snakes are more of a more of an issue in southern Illinois than than further north. And like Chris Ribbick got camera stuff from Wisconsin, and snakes are you know in grasslands, snakes are very rare, very mm -hmm. rare as the predator there. But it's uh, you know, mammals. So, I mean, they get replaced. There's still high predation rates. It's just a different suite of predators that seem to be uh, hitting them. Hmm. Uh, that's really interesting. So here, here, here's Doug to everyone. Were you envious of Noah Strike is big here, the guy was 6,000? Hell yes. <laughs> 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 I, I would have loved it. Although I, I actually think the most miraculous thing about Noah Striker's global big year was it was it he didn't get some hideous disease. Um, or get trapped somewhere, or arrested somewhere, or uh, uh, you know that that's or, or just wear out to a frazzle. Global bird watching is um, 
I, I love it. Don't, don't get me wrong, but it's uh, it's not not really uh, uh, that easy. So I I think he was just in and out, Scott, before anybody knew he was there, including mosquitoes. I, I, I think that's got to be it. I actually uh, ran into the Dutch guy who broke his record the next year, um, and, uh, and he he. He was also one of those just tireless people who, who uh, just some people's energy never never goes away. I'm yeah. I'm not one of those. It's, okay. you, you have to do that kind of thing when you're in your 20s and not married. <laughs> no, yes, exactly. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, yeah. Being a graduate student is uh, the best time imaginable because you can really do nothing but gather data. Uh, once once the kids came around, then suddenly it became me me living vicariously through my students. So. Um, All righty. Well, Scott, again, thanks very much for joining us for a, a delightful talk. Really enjoyed it. And it was great seeing you again. We just wish we could have gotten you back in Illinois. And yeah. I hear Mike had promised you Smith's long spur. So we'll have to put that one on rain check on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was I was hoping to come back next weekend for the uh, 50th anniversary of the spring bird count. But uh, I don't that's not looking very likely at this point. So. I was, I was going to do my old Dutch Creek route. Yeah. So, um, yeah, fun. when you get back hey. to town, let us know. We'd love to show you around a little bit. But again, thanks uh, a great deal for joining us for a, a great talk. You're welcome. And thank you very much. And thank